Uh, hello, everybody. My name is John Dole. I'm with North Carolina State University, and it is my pleasure to get us started. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce the speakers and give us a little bit of an idea of what we're going to do today. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar on management and research on cut peonies. Uh, we have got three uh, world-renowned experts here on peonies. I'm going to start with Nathan Jonke, who graduate student at NC State, PhD candidate, and I, he organized all of this. So we want to collectively thank him for that, getting this all together. Uh, he's going to be telling us about his research here in a bit. Um, he grew up in North Dakota, and he's a lifelong horticulturist. He uh, operated his own greenhouse, producing bedding plants when he was before college. I got his BS from North Dakota State University, not surprising there. And then MS, working with geraniums and botrytis from Michigan State, and staying on for his PhD. Um, grad student extraordinaire, teaching, research, and extension. <laughs> uh, Dave Dowling is uh, the next one, former president of the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. I have three times, is that correct? Yes, four. <laughs> yeah. three times, seven years altogether. Seven <laughs> years, so we want to thank him for that. Cut flower grower in Maryland for 20 years, selling at farmer's market, retail florists, and whole foods. In 2014, he was hired away by Edney Bulb Company, which has since become part of the Fred C. Gleckner Foundation. And I also just want to thank Dave. I think he has tirelessly helped more cut flower growers in the United States and probably other countries than anybody else through answering emails, presentations, and just conversations at meetings. Just been an <laughs> incredible resource for all of the cut flower growers uh, around. And Gary Testagner uh, from University of Washington, or excuse me, Washington State University. Oh, bad faux pas on my part. <laughs> that is uh, PhD and MS from University of California, Davis in plant pathology. Uh, 40 years working in plant pathology of floriculture crops. And I am totally not exaggerating when I say world renowned expert uh, in floriculture. Um, has been all over the world and just has a vast amount of experience in plant pathology. And we're so thankful for all of you for joining us today. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nathan just to give us a little bit of information on how this is all going to run. Welcome everybody. So uh, this webinar, as Dr. Dole said, will have four different speakers. There'll be approximately about half an hour for each person with uh, time for about one or two questions after each person, but there will also be a Q&A at the end for everybody to ask questions. In order for you to do that, there is a chat feature through Zoom that you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. It looks like a little message bubble. Uh, so if you have any questions or have any issues with the webinar or Zoom, type it in there and I'll, I'll help you out with that. And I'll be the one reading the questions and relating it to the person of interest. So yeah, please use that. Um, so first, the, in the order of the webinar, uh, John is gonna give us a little overview of peonies and where they're at in the world today. Then Dave is gonna talk about production, I'll follow up with post-harvest and Dr. Chastigner will talk about disease and pest management. So with that, John, I'll give it away to you. Just take me a moment here while I share my screen. All right, I assume everybody can see this now, the peony. Uh, not quite. Oh. Nope. <laughs> How about now? Nope. Nope. Just you. Just me. All right. We did practice. We did. There, <laughs> there we go. you go. There you go. We got your screen server in the background now, so we're good. Okay. Hopefully that works. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, my part of the presentation won't be too long. I just wanted to give you a background on the peony, a little bit of history, and a little bit about why we are doing all this work on peonies. Um, as Nathan mentioned, uh, Dave Dowling is going to talk about peony production, Nathan is going to talk about post-harvest, and Gary about disease and pest management. 
And I don't know if you noticed, but I tried to pick the pink of Sarah Bernhardt in terms of the coloring for that slide. I just thought I'd throw that in there. A little bit on the peony itself. There are approximately 33 species of peony that are native to northern temperate zones of Asia and Europe. Uh, the folks in North America may not realize that we have two species native uh, to Western North America. I've actually had the opportunity to see uh, one, of the one of the native species in Utah, uh, quite a bit different than what we think of as our cultivated peony. Paeonia lactiflora is the most commonly grown of the peonies. There are a number of species, as I mentioned. It is native to East Asia. And like a number of our most common plants, cultivated plants, it was cultivated in China for over 3,000 years. So a very long history for this plant in terms of cultivation. We think of it primarily as an ornamental, uh, but there is quite a bit of history and there's quite a bit of literature, so to speak, on the peony as a medicinal plant as well. I would say for today's webinar, we're focusing just on the ornamental part. Uh, in the U.S. and Canada, and again, sorry for leaving out the folks that are in other countries, but uh, I want to give a little bit of idea on the history here. Uh, we know that it was probably cultivated before 1800. There's an occasional reference uh, to it, uh, but it appeared to be widely grown by the mid-1800s, uh, primarily as a garden ornamental at that time. And in fact, that's when we start to see some of the cultivars being produced. In fact, many of the cultivars available today can trace their lineage back to um, the 1800s, very long time cultivars. It became widely grown as a cut flower since the late 1800s, and it became a major cut flower in the early 1900s. We see some references to large acreages being produced at one time, more than 40,000 acres at one time. Uh, since then, uh, production has declined, especially in the 70s and 80s. Peony production really went down. Uh, it lost favor. It was not uh, one of the common cut flowers anymore. Um, but it still was being grown. It has never completely disappeared, as some of the longtime growers will tell you. Uh, so why are we working on peonies now? Uh, the fact is that peony has researched as a major cut flower. Uh, we did a survey of the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers membership, and this paper was published uh, this year. And at the time, it was the second most commonly grown cut flower uh, in the United States and Canada. Now, it's not the second most important uh, in the United States, that still is the lily. Lily is the most important in terms of dollar value, um, but it was the second most commonly grown. Um, with over 75% of the growers responding to our survey, uh, which was over 211, I think, uh, growing the peonies. For those who are interested in this sort of thing, the zinnia was actually number one. Again, zinnia is not the most important cut flower, but it was the most commonly grown with 83% of the respondents growing it. Uh, this, the peony has grown in, sorry for the pun there, the peony production has increased so much that it is now tracked by the USDA. Uh, when the USDA started doing the floriculture surveys again, uh, as of last year, uh, they included peony um, because of its important. And I'm going to list the states there, and just happens, of course, that North Carolina is number one uh, in terms of that, that survey. Uh, Oregon, number two. Washington, number three. Alaska, we're going to talk a little bit about the special significance of Alaska here in a bit. And then, of course, California, number five, which tends to score high on a lot of crops. Um, so again, why are we working on peonies? Um, the fact is, there's a relatively short base life. You know, for a major cut flower, a flower that is so important in the industry, uh, it is one of our shorter-lived cut flowers. Uh, hence, there is a lot of interest in trying to get it longer and maximize the base life. The other major issue with, uh, with peonies is that it has a limited harvest period. Uh, so, 
any one area of the world. It how the harvest period is anywhere from four weeks. Um, sometimes it's, if it's warm, we're lucky to get four weeks all the way up to six, maybe eight weeks in terms of, of the spread among the various cultivars from the early flowering to the late flowering. And then how you organize your field. Uh, some folks have been able to have parts of the field that are colder and they can stretch out production even a little bit more there. Uh, there is also some production in high tunnels and a little bit in greenhouse that helps to spread things out. But for the most part, there's a great need for long-term storage research uh, because it is a major cut flower. It's a beloved cut flower in many areas. Uh, there is demand for it year round and we're just not able to supply it. What helps us out in that regard is that it tolerates storage quite well. In fact, of all the flowers we work with, this is probably one of the best that naturally stores well, uh, more so than many, many other cut flowers. Uh, we do a lot of work with many, many different species, and most do not store well at all, um, which actually is great for the US and Canada in terms of local markets. Uh, the other aspect of it is that the peony tolerates freezing temperatures. And Nathan's gonna get into that in more detail, uh, how he's been able to exploit that characteristic of the peony uh, in terms of long-term storage. The other aspect of this is that anything we do to get peonies to last longer um, can help with related cut flowers. In particular, any of the species that we think of as cool seasons, cut flowers, those that are generally grown cool and have to be stored very cold to keep them from developing. Uh, tulips, iris, anemone, ranunculus uh, being some of the major ones. And then the last item there is for Gary and it's what uh, Gary, when he comes on, he can tell us how many years he's been researching peonies. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, there's a fairly long list of diseases on peonies and that also requires a bit of, not a bit, a lot of research uh, to help control those diseases and keep the crop economical. So I wanna give you a quick overview. Because of the limited harvest period for peonies as, it, uh, um, as they come into flower, peony production moves around the world based on the location. And what I've centered here is on Israel. Uh, the start, so to speak, of the peony season uh, in, in March uh, through specialized cultural techniques, high tunnels, a treatment with GA, in some case cold storage of the roots, they're able to get peonies to start flowering uh, the earliest of just about any country. Uh, there are some others that are doing it as well, but certainly the earliest of the major production locations. Uh, then you can see the circle has gone into main, the main part of Europe and over into Southeast United States. Um, I mentioned earlier, North Carolina is a major supplier of peonies and we have a, one of the largest peony farms in the country is of course in Eastern North Carolina. So that starts the season for us uh, in May quite often um, and then in Southern Europe. Then as we go later in the season. Uh, the production season in Europe moves into Northern Europe. Uh, in the United States, it moves into Central and North Central United States with a number of production farms and locations. And of course, in Oregon and Washington, uh, which are the, the major, major producers of cut peonies uh, for the United States and even for the world. And then we, that's where Alaska comes in. Uh, it moves further north where we get production from June, July, and even in some cases, although we can hear from the Alaskans, uh, into, into early August. Uh, then we switched over to the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, this is where we, we see peony production in Chile and New Zealand. Uh, they are doing all the same things our growers are doing in terms of trying to space out the cultivars, space out the production areas, uh, these countries do have gradients as well within the country uh, from north to south that allows them to spread out harvest over a period as well. But even with all this highly 
developed and elaborate production, there are still fairly large gaps uh, in the availability of quality, quality peony flowers, flowers that will open up fully and have a reasonable base life. In this photo here, I just wanted to show, uh, this is a farm in Chile that I visited several years ago. All right, um, I think we've got time. I've kept that fairly short. I wanted to make sure our fellow presenters would have plenty of time. Um, Nathan, do we have a question or two at this stage? Nathan, you're on mute, I'm afraid. Uh, there we go. I have not seen any questions yet. Okay. Well, keep them in mind. As Nathan said, oh, we will have go. time. Uh, Cynthia is asking, what is the species native to the U.S.? Uh, Paeonia californica is the one that's native to the West Coast. I think it's, of course, in California on up through Oregon. And, and Gary, do you know if it goes up into Washington? He might be on me. There we go. You should be able to talk now, Gary. Oregon. It goes just up into Oregon. Uh, and I'm blanking on the species name of the one, the second one. The second one has a much wider distribution. It goes, I do know that one goes up into Washington, but it also goes uh, east into Idaho and Utah. Uh, there are no peonies uh, west, or excuse me, east of the Rocky Mountains. So there's the two species. Uh, they are not easy to grow. Uh, they require very well-drained soils, very specific growing conditions. Um, Interesting species, but not commercially uh, viable as ornamentals. John, there's Thanks a few questions question. on the uh, gaps and the harvest months. Uh, can you go over that a little bit more specifically and where those gaps are and who's harvesting in what months? Yeah, I think the biggest gap is between Alaska and the Southern Hemisphere production, uh, which um, without storage runs from August probably through October. Uh, with storage, some of the Alaska folks have been able to ship even into September, um, but still that's, that's a big one there. And then uh, another gap is after the, uh, the, the Southern Hemisphere production and before Israel, large-scale production starts in Israel. Um, the Southern Hemisphere folks, sphere hoax, Southern Hemisphere folks have been pushing the envelope there um, but I still think that from what I understand, there's a gap in, uh, uh, in January through, through February, probably the longest one there as well. Yeah, good question. That um, depends on the amount of storage folks are doing and how successful they are with storage, which Nathan will cover here in a bit. One more question. When would you expect production for the central Midwest? When do we expect that? Uh, generally June. Um, as the season has been earlier due to, due to changing weather conditions, it's getting a little earlier. Uh, the Midwest goes, you know, there's production down in Missouri all the way up into Wisconsin and Minnesota. So that's a bit of a big geographic zone right there. So of course it starts earlier in Missouri and later northern Minnesota. Um, it can go in well into June. Um, if it's a cold year, I think they might even get a little bit into July. Um, but then, of course, Alaska is starting to pick up then. Uh, some of the folks in those states probably have a better idea, specifically, of production in that area. If we're done with questions, 